Thank you for coming. <laughs> best, best start ever. First time on the conference, first talk. It's not going very well. But hopefully we'll be able to improve that a bit. So moving back to the uh, presentation. I think the, be the easiest way to explain what DI is, is just an example. In order to do so, let's introduce a coffee maker as a simplest example how it may be done. So without the dependency injection, the usual, usual case would be to create objects uh, and not passing them via constructor. And with dependency injection, it's the opposite way. We try to pass them in order <coughs> to be able to uh, do some <coughs> uh, operations or facilities on it. So in general, it's all about construction, how we actually construct the objects. Do we need dependency injection? Well, no, it's not really a case. However, DI can help us develop in our applications a bit. Because DI promotes loosely coupled code, which means that we can separate the business logic from the uh, from the uh, logic of creation objects. We can express easily what and not how. We can easily refactor, which I will show in a sec. We can test easily because we can fake objects as well. I'll just say, if you have any questions, just put in. I may go too fast or too slow. I have a lot of to, to say and it's like we are quite late. So, Do we need a library? We don't need a library. However, a library may improve our situation as well. So that would be the usual case, how we implement the basic uh, <coughs> object creation. We can have factories and other stuff. However, the base case is that we have some objects, and we have to maintain how to create them. It's a boilerplate code, because no one wants to do so. Because uh, there are cases in which every change of that will cause our, in, uh, our input to be, to be done. So order of these dependencies is important. And any change will require our input too. So in order to show that, I will try to give a quick example. I will just be able to. Okay. Okay. So let's go to the code. So we have our classes. Render. Mm, I can try. I'll get the font. Is that so better? So we have controller, render, view, model. It's just simple MVC to implement. And we have our application. In order to create these objects, I'll have two cases without the dependency injection. Without the dependency injection, we have to obviously instantiate them. That's the basic case. And, and create the app. It's nothing magical about that. With the DI, on the other hand, we don't have to worry about that because we can just say a DI to create it for us. We'll get into it how it's done later. However, that's the basic case. What about when we change the constructor of something, let's say controller, instead of model view, because of our refactor, we'll change the order to view model. Well, in our case, without the dependency injection, we'll have to change the order here, which is obviously a, a code which we'll have to maintain. And I would argue that that's one of the reasons why we have a lot of legacy code, because 
no one likes to maintain code like that. And when we are on, uh, when developers are under pressure, they tend to, you know, it will be easier to extend, for example, a type or something like that, break the single responsibility principle and just ship the code instead of, uh, you know, trying to make the dependencies happen the proper way because the order is important here. So let's imagine that we change the order of dependencies, which, for example, model depends on the view or view depends on the model. So we'll have to change all these cases here, which, which won't be easy in some cases. And obviously it's, it's nothing which we want to do because it's just tedious. Another case where dependency injection might be useful, and with, uh, let me just back for a sec. With dependency injection, we don't have any changes. So it's pretty much the same code. We just create. It's like, it, for DI, it doesn't matter how to create the tree because uh, where, the tree, where the objects are, because the tree is pretty much the same for the DI. It just, just the same case. What about when we, when we add anything to the controller? For example, we'll add the configuration. Well, the same case as previously, we have to, we have to add another parameter to the, con uh, to the constructor of the controller, which will have to be maintained. And in case when we have thousands of lines like that, it might be quite difficult. With DI, on the other hand, it's pretty much the same code again. Okay, so, so wrapping it up, what DI can help us with? Testing, so we can, for example, create a MOX provider, which will, which will pass uh, MOX instead of interfaces for us automatically. We don't have to do anything. So it's like more like in Java when, when you have mocks and you can create just an application and we say create an app with all mocks. We don't care how. We can serialize. So that might be an example maybe I will show. So we can have a tree and if you have plain of data we can just uh, serialize all of it as well. Bec here we, we are using the uh, uniform initialization to do so because the constructor and the member will be the same. So we can just we know exactly what types we have there and we can just serialize them. We can dump relationship between types. So that example I will try to show as well. So we can show the tree of the objects and how they relate. We can also restrict types, which we don't want to be passed. For example, if we have view, maybe we don't want to pass a model or something like that. We can restrict stuff like that. Or maybe we have a policy in the company that raw pointer cannot be passed, only smart pointers are allowed, or something like that. All of that might be accomplished with DI, so it's quite handy if it comes to that. You can try it yourself. Well, we had this uh, uh, talk about library in a week. DI actually allows you online to, to check it out uh, on, the, uh, on the website, so you can check it out yourself. If you're still not convinced, there is a real life example which I will have a talk, a, a little bit of advertisement, sorry about that, on um, Thursday, how to actually do that with the Rangers and MSM. So you can participate that if you're still not convinced. So let's look at <coughs> dependency injection libraries in the wild. So obviously DI is quite popular in Java and C Sharp, however, not as much in C++. The reason behind it is the fact that in C++ it's quite hard, for example, to deduce constructor parameters or we have pointers, references, error values and templates, concepts. We have so many different approaches towards doing stuff. Moreover, we do not have static reflection, so it's not that easy to, to do so. However, there are quite a few libraries in C++. Actually, there is another talk here as well about DI later on. So, here is a comparison about libraries which I've chosen. There is one for, there, there are two for Java, one for Ninja, uh, for C Sharp, and two for C++. So, as you can see, 
they more or less similar. However, the approach they have is different. So you can have approach which you will be at compile time. So all the dependencies have to be resolved during the compilation time. You can have runtime approach when you can change your dependency tree during runtime. You can have both. So here it's quite fun, uh, quite interesting example of Dagger. It's like we know that in Java it's quite hard to do anything in the compile time. However, they have this notion of annotation processor. So you annotate stuff and you can write a parser during compilation time in order to generate code. So that's the way Dagger is doing that. And Dagger is the most similar library to the one I'm trying to propose here if it comes to if it comes to approach. Obviously errors. So the library I'm here for example is trying to do everything at compile time. We have Google Fruit which is trying to combine both words and obviously like Google Juice is using reflection mechanism so it's based on exceptions and Ninja as well. So I've done some benchmarks how, how they actually compare. So the benchmark is about creating a simple unique object tree as we had before. It's just bigger. So we have a lot of classes which have a lot of dependencies and we just want to create them. Obviously we don't have any bindings which uh, say us uh, about the configuration, we just want to create a, create, a, cre create an app for us. So baseline, baseline would be uh, how objects are, uh, how, how, how it would be done by hand. So we would create one object, second object, third object, we'll pass all dependencies and finally we would create an app. But the baseline is the code we don't want to maintain and but it's, it's good to have a baseline for that. So, so you can see, I, I, I wanted to compare compilation times, executable size, and execution time. So you can see that, <coughs> so here is the, the library which we're talking about. You can see that it compiles quite fast. It compiles faster than Java, which is, in my opinion, pr quite amazing. amazing. It's faster in this example than Google Juice and Dagger 2. <laughs> Obviously, it's not faster than the baseline. But Google Fruit, which is C++11 library, is much slower if it comes to compil compilation times. Size, <coughs> I didn't compare size for Java because it doesn't make much sense. But if you, that's the stripped uh, libraries, by the way. So you can see that BoostDI is actually producing quite a, a good code. And execution time, execution time is exactly the same because there's no performance overhead and we'll look into it later, how it's done, actually. So if you go to 256 types and four parameters for the constructor or less, we can see that, for example, Google Fruit compilation time increases quite a bit. It's because of the implementation. Uh, Dagger is still much slower than BoostDI. Google just is a bit faster right now. However, if it comes to execution time, uh, BoostDI is still the same as the baseline and others are just much slower. I don't know exactly why c -sharp implementation is so slow. I tried to optimize it and I used Mono, however, although it compiles extremely fast, it's extremely slow too. Uh, I think it's the because of the, the reflection they're actually using. But I didn't investigate that too much, so don't quote me on that. And that's the final one, which I prepared. So we can see that Google Fruit compiles 23 seconds and produce 4 megabytes, which is not exactly what we want from a library, which, not do, which is not doing much, it just creates an object for us. But the AI, I think it's still reasonable. It's still much faster than Dagger 2 and produce pretty reasonable executable size and it's as fast as the baseline. So yeah, that's about uh, benchmarks. I hope if you are interested, there are more benchmarks on the website. You can go and check it out. So yeah, I was talking about uh, a bit about the library. However, I haven't introduced it. So so let's introduce that. So it's a Boost DI library, which I proposed some time ago to Boost. 
uh, a bit of history. So firstly, I implemented a version for C++03, C++11. It was basically based on preprocessor. If you had C++11 and various templates, it was using what it was available. However, it has a lot of problems with it. It compiled slowly because it was based on Boost MPL. Error messages were just horrible. A lot of workarounds because I wanted to make it more work with Visual Studio, which is never an easy case. So right now, we have a different, a new version of the library, which was released basically a few days ago as well. At first, I was experimenting with Bothana to do so. However, in 2014, it wasn't stable enough to, to use it. <coughs> wasn't compiling as fast as I was hoping for as well. But it, it was really easy to write it with it. But in the end, I ended up with doing it without it. So how big is the library? The library is just one header which is generated. So you can just copy paste it and use it. It's just 3,000 lines. There's no boost, no STL required, so you can use it on embedded systems. There's no ifs, no virtuals, no exceptions in the code at all. <coughs> That's the reason why it can be optimized so easily and why it's so performing so, so well. So it works on Clang, Xcode, GCC, and it even works on MVC. It took quite a bit of my life to make it happen. <laughs> but yeah, I finally got it, so yeah, enjoy, enjoy MVC, especially. So I just wanted to quickly talk about, to ensure you that the library is quite in a good status nowadays, and how the quality is ensured. So obviously I compiled with all the flags available, I have Travis Abveyor built every build. I test as many compilers I can get there. I use static analysis, Valgrind, Dr. Memory, Clang format even, uh, to have the style uh, as well. And I deploy documentation to the GitHub. I have tests. It's coverage quite good, but it's not saying as much since there's no ifs or anything there. There are a lot of examples you can follow. And I just wanted to, t to say something about the tests because there are different, obviously, types of tests I have. However, the last one, runtime performance tests, are quite interesting. In order to ensure that the, the performance is always there, the way I do it is I have, for example, a, a test one, one test, which one function which uh, returns, for example, make, u make unique implementation, and the other, uh, the other function which do the same thing with, with DI, and after that, I <coughs> uh, compile that with the uh, optimi optimizations on, I get the assembler, and I verify the opcodes, whether they are pretty much the same. Obviously, I do not check whether the memory pointers are the same. However, the instructions, the number of them, as well as mm, which ones should be called, are exactly the, sh have to be exactly the same. And this way I can ensure that with each commit, the library is performing the same way. Let's talk a bit about the design. So I had a few goals in mind when I was implementing the library. Obviously, the first one was to have as many runtime overhead as possible. Obviously, we are in C++. We don't want to pay for a library which creates an object for us. And yeah, moving back to that, and that was accomplished. DI has almost none runtime overhead. There is only a case when you want to expose type via different translation units, but you don't have to use that when you pay for the type erasure. But besides that, there's no, no cost at all for you. Compile as fast as possible. So I guess that was achieved because it compiles faster than Java. Can't complain about that. Another thing was that, in my understanding, the I should guarantee 
that object, that the tree which we want to create, will be created properly if it compiles. And the file library is only compile time. You can obviously change the dependency at runtime. However, the way it's done, it guarantees that whether it compiles, the objects will be created. I don't know whether you are experienced with DI. However, usually, the way it's done, we have to, in C++, because we don't have static reflection, we have to have some macros. DI has a macro too. However, it's not mandatory in order to specify constructor parameters. How, how, you know, it's like, because we cannot take, constructor is not a function in a sense that we cannot take and verify and, you know, we cannot have a function trait on the constructor yet. So that's a bit of challenge. I will show you how, how, how it's done in a sec. And the final goal I had in mind was that the eye should be easy to extend. And that was accomplished via scopes, policies, and providers, which, <coughs> which led us. So my idea was to have a core as small as possible and have scopes and, and have facilities in order to extend it. And I have 14 extensions, and some of them I'll actually show it later. So what is the architecture of it? So basically, the idea is that we have a core, which the injector, binder, any type is there, and as well as dependency, which is a glue between user interface and the core. On top of that, we have wrappers. Wrappers are responsible to convert a type to a specific, to, to request it. So for example, in the DI, I don't want to store five copies of shared pointers, const ref, pointer, or something like that. Instead, we have a wrapper which converts stuff to required information. We have scopes. Scopes are <coughs> uh, responsible for the lifetime of the object. I'll send it in a second. And basically, that's basically it. Everything else, providers are responsible for create, cre cre creating objects. So as I said, bindings, that's a DSL, which uh, I'll show in a sec which is responsible for giving a configuration. So for example, if we have interface and implementation and we would like to bind interface to implementation, that's the binding. Because obviously DI cannot figure it out for, for us what we would like to interface to be. Scopes, scopes are responsible for the maintaining the object of the lifetime. So for example, we can have singleton scope, which is the same as the application scope. We can have Unique scope, which will be just per request. Providers, providers are responsible to create the objects. So here, for example, the new is happening. And policies, policies are basically just visitors. They can be done at runtime or on, on compile time. For example, policies are responsible uh, to limit the objects, like which objects we would like to be injected. And that's just configuration. So basically, in a nutshell, it looks like that. We have an injector, which is a pseudo curve, by the way. Uh, we have a create, we verify the policies, we have a binder, binder has all <coughs> bindings, we resolve the type we want, we have a constructor trait, which will be explained in a sec how to actually get the constructor parameters, we wrap it up with the wrapper and create the type with the provider this way create works. And create is the basic functionality the I provides. So let's talk a bit about the user guide. So we actually had this example before, how to create an object tree. So let's say we have an application which is model v control again and how to create that user approach. We had that already. And we put the I. It's just make injector which creates the injector and create creates the object. Obviously here make injector is empty, however, usually we would have some bindings there. So my make injector implementation is straightforward. We just pass dependencies. We have some concepts. It's not exactly the implementation, that's the proposal how the concept should look like. I obviously have macro for that because it's C14. 
how injector looks like. Basically, there's nothing uh, magical here. We have just one function create, which is responsible for creating objects. So let's talk about how we can actually achieve uh, function traits for the constructor without having the static reflection. As far as I thought, that was impossible in C++. However, you know, C++ always proves that there's always a trick to do so. So the trick here is to use user-defined implicit conversion operator. So here are the links. If you want to check it out yourself, you can just go uh, for the one box and check it out. So how does it work? We have any type which has an impl impl implicit uh, conversion operator to any type. This way, we can check whether it's constructible actually works for example. We cannot, you know, figure out what types it will, that we don't know that is int or double, but we know that this constructor might be constructed with two parameters already. So that's pretty useful already, actually. However, it won't work properly because of the copy constructor and move constructors, because they will as well, they will always be true. The solution for that is just to, <coughs> to disable, uh, disable, temp disable the T when the T is convertible to the type which we want to have. So, for example, when we create example and we pass any type example, and the type T, in case, for example, of move constructor, will be example as well. So we can check whether the T example is convertible to example. This way we can disable it, and it will work for, param uh, for the uh, constructor with one parameters too. Limitations. However, this solution won't work for, for cases like that. So when we have a constructor, a templated constructor which is uh, uh, implemented like that. The only solution for that is to restrict the type, and that's what is actually happening in most cases. So for example, std function has the requirement to be callable. It's, it's also true in Visual Studio 2015 update 2. Before that, it's actually, there's no requirement there, and therefore it won't work for us. We will have to pass the macro for the for the visual. But if you use Visual Studio 2015, they have requires there as well, and cases like that will work too. How we calculate the numbers of parameters? So obviously, knowing that we have specific amount of mm, parameters in wi with which we can create a constructor is not enough, and therefore we have to you know, iterate a bit. So it's basically a for uh, for the <coughs> uh, constructor, and we check whether it's constructible with any type for like the amount of any type we want. So, for example, here we'll check whether it's constructible for any type, any type, any type, any type, any type, any type, and we'll just find out the highest number. So this way. We, when we have in, uh, index uh, sequence, we can easily verify how many parameters there will be there. Which is uh, quite handy because knowing that we can actually mm, trigger our construct constructor to be created with the, with the number of parameters which are required for it. How is it done in DI? Well, there's one thing missing in, in the standard, because we don't have the ability to check whether the uniform is initialization is actually applicable. So we have to add it in just a straightforward implementation. Uh, I don't know whether it's the proposal for that, but I, I think it is somewhere. Uh, so this way, we can create, for example, example when the constructor is not provided. As I said before, that might be really handy for the serialization because 
if you know that we have example and we have int and int, we can traverse through them and just serialize them. We can do that for all uh, objects in our tree, so we can serialize our application without doing any magic. Uh, so any type, so knowing that the type, uh, the constructor is creatable for a type is not enough, we have to create it as well, and that's the way it's, it's done here. So the implementation of the implicit operator here is that we just create the type from the injector, and that's basically it. So instead of giving the proper type from the beginning, we give the any type, which will convert to the type, and when it converts to the type which is required from the constructor, we'll just create it from the DI. So, constructor trait, uh, I don't know whether you've seen that on the, uh, <coughs> uh, on the design, but it was used there in order to get the constructor parameters. And here, there are three steps. At first, we check whether we have the macro, which explicitly say what constructor should look like. If we don't, we traverse through the <coughs> uh, direct con uh, construction, and we return and we check whether how many constructor how many parameters constructor has and we return the pair of 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 direct and any type any type any type depends on how many constructors how many parameters constructors has we do the same for the uh, braces and if not we cannot find anything we just return the error so when we come back to design so for example here Will the, for example, uniform uh, type will be returned, which says that is an aggregate, as well as the amount of the constructor parameters which are required. And then we just can create that going through. So let's talk about the bindings. So bindings are basically the principle of the DI. Obviously, we don't have, all cases are not as straightforward as others because usually we have interfaces and we have to choose somehow which interface should be chosen. With DI, we can do that quite easily. We just say bind iView to GUI view, and that's all. This way, GUI view will be injected when iView is requested. And it doesn't matter with whether iView is shared pointer, unique pointer, reference, that will be handled too. Values? Well, sometimes we want to bind the value. So, for example, here we would like A, which is an int, to be a 42, or double to be 87. It's pretty much the same. Instead of binding t interface to a type, we bind the type to value. I was asked many times about that, so the I is at compile time, however, a lot of uh, applications require <coughs> changing the bindings at runtime. It is possible, although the DI is a compile time one, in order to do so, we can just bind view to the lambda, which will, where injector will be passed, and we'll just select how to create the, the view. We don't have to pass the injector, however, if you want, for example, let's say that the GUI view has other others constructors parameters, and we don't want to care about them ourselves, and we want DI to do it for us, that's the way to do it. So for example, this way, we can easily implement XML injection, which is quite popular in Java. So if you look at Spring in Java, it's based on XM XMLs. So for example, instead of having that in the code, we can say that I view should be a GUI view in the XML. I don't know how useful is that, but that's the Java approach. Yeah, here we have more uh, things how to, for example, we would like to inject a vector or whatever or set, doesn't really matter. We can say just pass 
you know, just pass the initialization list and just create it for us. We can do the same with types. So, for example, we, when we have a vector of interfaces and we would like to pass, uh, we would like DI for create for us implementation one and two. And let's assume implementation one and two have different constructors. We don't want to, you know, face that. So that's the way it can be done. Here, the, the star is required because otherwise it won't compile as interface has is virtual. Scopes, as I said, you have. Uh, that's the difference between DI, uh, boost DI, and other uh, <coughs> approaches. So. In C++, we can deduce the scope. We don't actually need to say, oh, that's the singleton, that's the, I don't know, unique scope. Because we have this information in the constructor. When we require a reference, we know that the object has to be stored somewhere. When we have a shared pointer, well, that probably should be shared. If we have unique pointer, well, we want to have something which is unique. So DI, by default, they do the scopes. So that, that's the way the scope works. So singleton scope is pretty much the same as application scope. Unique scope works just for just per request. We have also the user scope when the DI is not handling it because it's provided by the user. As I said, scope detection. So for example, when we have R value pointer or unique pointer, we want to it to be per request. In a lot of cases, we want to have just a singleton. We can change the scope as well. So you can say, bind it in singleton or bind in whatever you want. This part I will skip because we are short on time. And I will move to more interesting stuff. I'll just skip this, this link. OK. So, this is quite popular topic in, in the C++ community. We don't have concept. And obviously, when we have DI, we would like to have as good error messages as possible. So standard way, standard way we do it right now is just you know, to enable if, which works in most cases. So for example, that's the way providable concept Emu concept emulation I'm doing. It's, it's just the, the way we actually do it in any <coughs> other software these days. However, it doesn't actually, oh sorry. So here it's like Paul was talking about it. When we disable the function, we don't actually get the proper error message because the disabling part might be done few functions later. And in order to get the proper uh, error, we can transport the failure. So for example, we check the, the error, which the function which was disabled, how, why it was disabled, and we pass it to the, to the callee. However, it won't work in our case, because how we can return the type here? We can, dis we can just disable this function, but we, we are not able to you know, figure out why this function was disabled. What was the problem? So solution, my solution for that is to split concepts into two parts. One is to verify whether the concept is actually very f is is <coughs> is okay, and the other one is to so to show error message. So yeah, as I said, so first we check the predicate, and after that we show the error. How it's done? So. For example, let's talk about creatable concept, which is the main concept in the DI, which gives really nice messages, which we'll see in a sec. So let's assume creatable is just an easy concept which checks whether we can create the type. It just returns true or false. Having that, we can disable any type because whether it's not creatable, we can check whether the type we actually want is creatable or not. If not, we just disable it. This overload will be disabled. All of that will be disabled by compiler. But how to show the error? So in order to show the error, <coughs> the way DI is doing that is just, we have two paths. The first one is whether the, 
uh, when <coughs> uh, when we have the predicate satisfied, then we don't check any errors. When the predicate is is not satisfied, we go through the error paths, which this approach actually I'll talk about it a bit later may give us compilation improvements because we don't have to check for the error cases in uh, all the time because we know that it will work for us. If you want to show the error, we just basically verify the, the reason. So for example, in that case, if you don't bind view to the, for example, GUI view, we can check that the I view is an abstract, it's not bound, and we can just show the error. How to show the error? And that's, that's the thing which I'm using as a trick, that static line functions actually are not given at the call stack. So this way, we can have one liner saying, uh, saying, showing the error. However, we don't have to show all the call stack like, like with a static assert. So that's the difference. So the implementation. So for example, we have here type is not bound. We have the inline function which doesn't have an implementation, which has suggestion as well because that's the line which will be shown with the error. And <coughs> we have to change the, the error into the warning, but that's, that's the case in <coughs> every compiler which has to be done differently. And so, uh, so uh, wrap it up from the top to bottom. So we have create. We have two, two actually cases for create. One, when it's creatable, then we go through the success path. We don't do any checking there afterwards because we know that the type will be creatable there. So there's no issue there. Otherwise, we, so we, sh we say that we just deprecate it in order to show <coughs> the, the callee and the root function that the constraint is not satisfied and we go to the create imp which will be checking whether the concepts are satisfied later on. And if they are not satisfied, we show the error. So for example, we know that here, for example, iView is not creatable, so we can show the error. So how that will look? Let's say we have uh, the same app, and here we don't have bindings for iView and I, I view is required. It's not required. Here, let's assume that we have I view. Sorry for that. So what kind of error will we get from the eye? <coughs> That's the whole message which will be shown to you. It's not thousands of lines. It's just basically three lines. We have that create constraint is not satisfying that the callee where we called that's a bit of boilerplate, and after that we have suggestion that type view, i view is not bound, which says that oh you should bound i view to something, and that's the way how you can do it in the i. So I think that's pretty useful. GCC, GCC basically gives us the same information. It's a bit, the layout is a bit different, the type. Here is in the brackets, but besides that, we get the same three lines. What about Visual Studio? Visual Studio obviously is a bit different. However, it's not that bad. We don't have the suggestion because it doesn't show the error line, but we'll still get that you know, the abstract type is not bound with t equals i view. So it's quite easy to follow where is, where is the problem. We can also have a diagnostic level. So by default, <coughs> by default is one. So if we set that to zero, we will just get one error message, one line. Oh, creatable. You, c you can't create this type. There's no reason why. By default is one, which I just shown. If we, if we pass it two, we'll also get the, the call stack for the tree. So in this example, we, st we start from the app, after that was controller, and iView wasn't able to be created. So we can easily verify why, where is the mistake, what is not bound. Okay, let's talk a, a 
bit about extensions. So extensions provide an easy way to extend the core, and the core is <coughs> just 3,000 lines, so you kind of need some extensions to improve it. In DI we have three types of extensions which might be written. So the first one is scopes, so we can have a, our custom scope, for example, for the HTTP session we want to have a, a scope which will create a, a session, will start the session when the client connects and disconnect the session when it's finished and will destroy our objects. We can have policies which will create and visit objects. We can have providers, so that's the way how we want to create the objects. So it's basically like our allocators or something like that. So, simple showcase. That would be a policy to create, to just type, uh, ju just dump the types. So, for example, when we have an application with a lot of different dependencies, we can create a types dumper this way. When we are passed a lot of types, and we have like what what the type is, what the constructor type is, what the, what the given type, what the implementation, and we can just type it, uh, dump it for, for example, for this example, it will show us exactly that. So we have to pass it to the make, con make injector and we pass type damper, which is the configuration. And after that, when we run the app, we'll get app control model eye view as well, that GUI view is bound. So that, that, that's quite handy to understand what is actually created and when. Another extension is a serializable, serialized extension. So as I said before, using aggregate types and uniform initialization, we can easily serialize. So how that is done? We still have to create a policy for that. And the way it's done here, <laughs> we have to calculate the offset, obviously, because done, it will go through all the types which are required for the constructor. We'll just cast it to char star uh, and calculate the offset and we'll put that to the uh, serialized class. This way we'll get all types, offsets and names for them. And after that we can easily serialize that. So that's the way it might be done. So here like, the, the serial as we call is just uh, to figure out what types might be serialized. It, might, it has to be plain old data, so it's like int, doubles, stuff like that. And we just cast it from the pointer we have, we add the offset, and we get, and, and we get the, the output. To deserialize, it's pretty much the same because we al already have that in the string, we just get it from the string and we have the values already. So example output. <coughs> so let's say we have an app uh, with, with some plain old data, like data. For example, we would like to see data, even more data, to be serialized. How that can be achieved? So we create an injector with the with the, our, our policy, we serialize, and we just deserialize, and it will give us uh, output with the values. So, what what is useful here is the, the fact that we can easily serialize the whole tree. We don't have to serialize object uh, separately. We just say, oh, we have an app, and we would like to serialize whatever is a plain old data and it would just do it for us. Another example of the policy here is <coughs> how to limit types. So as I said before, sometimes you would like to limit the user from being able to <coughs> create to pass uh, to create a, to pass types in the constructor which are not the ones we want. For example, we have a policy in the company that raw pointers cannot be passed or something like that. So here it's an example that all, uh, all types has to be bound. 
so how, how we can do that? We create a policy. We say, un unless it's a, a planar data. Uh, <coughs> so how does it work? We create a policy, constructible. We say, it might be a pod, or it has to be bound. Bound, it has to be bound, it means that it has to be in the binding. So for example, bind iView has to be bound to GUI view. And as well, for example, any other class which is not a planar data will have to be bound too. So for example, if you have example class, we'll have to bind it explicitly because that's the policy says. We can also use std type traders like ispot. There's no, no limitations here. So for example, <coughs> we have our app, we have the injector, we pass uh, we pass the configuration, and the error we'll get <coughs> is that obviously constraint is not satisfied, type not a pod is not allowed, and what is pretty cool is that we can see the policy because sometimes it's quite hard and difficult to figure out why why is not allowed. Here we can see it. It's not as good as it could be. Because obviously w we would like to see, for example, that oh, is pod true, is bound false. However, that is not supported yet. <coughs> and all types which are not satisfied will be printed. So, as I said before, we're using stati static <coughs> function for sh showing an error. And the good thing about it is that we can show a lot of errors. So all the types which are not satisfied might be shown here. And the last extension I would like to talk is the MOX injector. So as I said before, it's really useful for us to say, or oh, create a fake app, which means create an app and pass for the all interfaces MOX. So that, that's the way we can do that. So we create another configuration. So when the type is not the polymorphic type, we just create it as usual. If it's not, if it, if it is polymorphic, we just get the mock. And what is the mock? Well, for in this example, I use fake it, which is a library to provide mocks. It's not a standard way of doing it, like Google mock, when you have the macros. Here, you don't specify the interface. It, use, it uses a trick with the vtable to get the proper functions. However, it does work on all compilers, so it's quite handy. So, let's come back to our example. <coughs> we can, in this case, we can easily... <coughs> we don't have to bind even the view to anything, like to fake view or whatever. We just bind whatever we want to fake, like the data. Usually with data we want to fake ourselves. And just create an app. App will be created, we won't get any error. And then, in the test, we can just get the mock for the, this uh, view and just do whatever we want with it. So that's <coughs> pretty useful for, for testing. If you're interested, there are more extensions. There are actually four, 14 extensions uh, <coughs> to look for the documentation. So the last thing I would like to talk about is the performance. So that's the test I've been doing. So for example, how does it work? When we bind end to a value and we create it, the, the assembler which will be produced will be exactly the same as 42, return 42. And that's what I'm actually checking with my, my tests. So I have this function, I disassemble it, and verify whether it's pretty much the same as the above. How it's done? Well, as I said before, we don't have any ifs, any virtuals, anything like that. So everything might be optimized. And therefore, when we call, we basically all, all of this stuff is just going to return 42 because there's nothing else which cannot be inlined or optimized. Another case, by an interface to implementation. So let's say we have this iView, we would like to, to bind it to a different type. 
and the output will be pretty much the same as make unique. So this no overhead here, which is quite quite handy. So let's talk about compilation times. As I said before, comp compilation times are quite good for the DI. It compiles faster than Dagger in Java. One of the reasons is that we are not using STL or Boost. We don't have to include anything. So we can see here on the benchmark how many how bindings actually affect our <coughs> our compilation times. So it's not much. If you have 200 bindings, it's still one second and a half, which is pretty much what all, all what we need for the huge app. That in case of even <coughs> more complex example, you can see how many instances are created here. It's just enormous benchmark, and it still compiles in four seconds. The difference here between the red line and the green line is the fact that here we use the macro, and here we just let constructor to be deduced, as I said, as I shown before. There is a bit of overhead with that. However, in a small case, basically there is none. Here, there is a bit more, but it's still, it's still, it's still not a lot. So, how how the yeah oh, sorry. The axis labeling of that graph is really misleading. Yeah. You should start such graphs always at zero. You should always start the y-axis at zero, then so that you can see. Okay, so it takes. A little less than four seconds with boost di in check, a little more with, with uh, the constructed, in, but it's still around four seconds in both cases. And it's not like, okay, the red line is almost nothing and the other one is five times as much. Because mm -hmm. that's what a single glance at this graph tells me. Okay, so the question was, because I was asked, the question was that the graph, the x should start from zero, and this is a fair point. Because otherwise, it's not easily visible. So, yeah, thanks for the question. I'll improve that definitely. Well, moving on, how the quick completions were achieved. So, the first thing it's always measured because it's like with all compilers, there are different cases which one has to consider when trying to improve the compilation times. There are some guidelines. We don't want to have a lot of templates instantiations, recursive templates algorithms might hurt us a lot. We don't want to do checks per, for example, per, per function. We want to che check them as early as possible and after they just move on. That's the one which cost a lot in the eye in the very beginning, the long type names. When you have a variadic template, like make injector is variadic, and we have a lot of bindings. And then the injector produce a long type name. And after that, when we do stuff with it, compilers have to compare the, the name, and it's quite slow, actually. <coughs> Obviously, it's useful to take some advantage of the buildings in the compiler. So for example, that's the way we can do and not be na naive. Make index, for example, is 01 in Clang 3.9. So it's quite handy to use it. So how it's done? So binder, for example, that's the main thing how we resolve dependencies in, uh, <coughs> in DI. It's based on the map trick in C++ with the inheritance. So the basic idea is that injector inherits from the bindings. We d dependency have a pair which the concept and the implementation, and after that, we can just simply resolve it with the well-known trick that the type which is inherited will, be, will go here to the pair, and pair will have the proper implementation too, will cast it to the proper one, and the way we'll get it otherwise, it will just handle the, the other case, which is our default case which means that the binding is not provided for it. So example, so we can provide some dependencies <coughs> and 
when result happens. Here it's like we provide the default one and we try to resolve I1 and we would like to get, uh, to get the implementation. So as I said, we have a pairs of I1 and implementation and after that they are inherited and we resolve the I1 and we'll get the implementation one from, from, the, uh, from the resolve. How quick is that? It's quite quick. So for the number of dependencies, it compiles pretty much less than 100 milliseconds. <coughs> and therefore it's, it's really useful because we try to resolve each type uh, when we create the tree. So if that would cost us a second, we would have really bad compilation times. So that's quite important. As I said, creditable concept is way is done a bit different way that from the usual concept. So you have two paths. The first one is when everything is all right, that we don't check anything, and the other one when when we know that the type is not creatable, but we don't know why because, as I said, any type we cannot f from the any type we cannot get the proper error message there. We cannot pass it back, and therefore we have two paths here. So create has <coughs> when when the type is creatable, we just go with the successful scenario. We don't check anything afterwards. When the type is not creatable, we show. The, you know, the, the, that the constraint is not satisfied and we go ahead and at some point we have a function like 10, 10 function calls later which is not satisfied and in case of error handling we just say show the error we still return the proper type but we use the starting uh, function which has not implementation which will cause the error to be shown but everything else we just compile. Another case, as I said, long type names may cost us a lot. <laughs> so we can use a type name erasure. I don't know if that's a term, but let's say it is. So, so the, when we have a long time, a long type, the comparison of it, which happens quite often, may cause a lot of uh, compilation overhead and in order to <coughs> to get rid of it oh yeah, so sorry so here is an example when, when we have make injector we have a lot of bindings which will create an injector with a lot of bindings which will be a long type name and after that we create the type of injector will be really long which will be passed around and it will have to be compared and it will cost a lot of time. Solution? Well, the, the basic solution and the easiest one is just to to remove the, the long type by having another type which inherited from, inherits from this type and just use the, the short one, which actually works. This way we have a, a type which is just few few letters long and it improves compilation times quite a bit. But it's not really a generic solution because it has to be done before the make injector happens, which is on the cli client code. Another a bit hacky solution, but it does work on Clang and more or, more or less of GCC, is to use lambda expression. Some, somewhat, somehow lambda expression actually produces a type unique type, but it, the name is not long. So this way, we can have this wrapper produce a shorter type name and use it afterwards. So I've done some benchmarks and it seems like... <coughs> so we only have a long type. It costs us five seconds, for example, to compile. When we erase the type with the inheritance, it's just two seconds. When we lose lambda, it's three seconds. And that's pretty much the same case for all compilers. So in DI, I'm using the, the lambda expression to, to remove the types because I'm, I cannot do 
uh, inheritance because that's f on the client side, but the Lambda expression might be used on the, uh, on the library side. So it's quite useful to improve the ti completion time this way. You can find more benchmarks as well. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is DI versus standard. What could be really useful to have? There are some missing features. Obviously, static reflection is the biggest one. Without it, it's hard to do the constructor deduction. Uh, but we can somehow overcome that with the solution I, I shown. It's not perfect, but it would be great to have ability to just have a function traits from the from the constructor. I don't know how that should work when the constructor is ambiguous, but I think it will be pretty much the same case with the functions. User-defined attribute is something which is quite often used in the DI implementation on older libraries. So, for example, that's pretty much how Java do, do that. So they use add, add inject. We could have an uh, inject attribute in order to select the constructor because I haven't shown that, but right now, in order to pick the proper constructor in the DI, you would have to have a macro, like boost DI inject this one. That would be <coughs> a nicer solution. We wouldn't have to use a macro. Named parameters. So sometimes we would like to distinguish the... When you have a constructor with two ints, we would like to distinguish which one should be passed to uh, to the uh, to the value, it would be nice to have named parameters which wouldn't add any <coughs> any <coughs> any additional information to the type, just the property. So this way, we would be able to just bind the t named type to the to the value. Right now, you still have to use the macro, so you have boost the inject named in the. A. It's pretty much the same syntax, however. It uses a macro, so it's not that that's nice. <coughs> so compile time strings, you can use it right now with the DI for the names. However, it's not standard and it's an extension, so mine <coughs> would be would be awesome to have that. I think that there's a proposal for that as well. And <coughs> the last thing is <coughs> the concept types. So obviously, when you have concepts. I, I implemented an extension for concepts <coughs> in order to support that because it would be great just to have the same way to bind concept as an interface. So bind interface to implementation, bind concept to the type which satisfies the concept. However, it's not that easy and it's not <coughs> possible with the current <coughs> uh, standard. It would be awesome to be able to do that. With the DI, you can do that right now, but you would have to name the concept. So here, you'd have to have named dummy and then bind dummy named mm, whatever name you would give it, and that would work. But otherwise, it wouldn't. Yeah, so the last thing I would like to say is like <coughs> DI is proposed for the review, however, there's no review measure. If you feel like DI could be useful for you, you can volunteer. Uh, yeah, so are there any questions? Yeah, I might. So there is another dependency injection token on the author of that library. It actually looks like this could replace ours. Maybe. Mine does some things different. Yeah, as far as I know, because I've seen uh, your talk, it's like your, your, your DI is about runtime, yeah? Yes. Runtime dependency injection, yeah. <coughs> so it's more like Jules, for example. Very much about erasing everything so that the injector is not a template. Yeah. So the problem with that is like you you have a yeah that, that's the reason it's like the for my goal with this uh, library was not to have the overhead yeah because it's C plus plus we don't want to pay much for the creation so of the. My view on that is we use that injector once on startup and then for the entire run of the application it doesn't really matter anymore because our object graph is complete. So. Yeah, that's one of the problems you have. However, it's like usually you would have, for example, when you have HTTP client, you would like to have a sessions 
new clients, you would have to create something yeah, at some point. Mm. Yeah? Some of the techniques like the constructing subtraction and the error messages and the type name erasure sound really useful also for other libraries. Are you planning to like ex extract those and make them available as a separate library because they, they really sound useful? <laughs> So the question was <laughs> sorry. So the question was whether uh, the things I was talking about with the type erasure, type name erasure, uh, construct, construct reduction, and other stuff, whether it will be available as a separate library. Well, I haven't thought of that obviously because that's the part of the library. But yeah, that might be useful to have that. Yeah, I'll definitely consider that. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat, please? Are your compile time benchmarks available? I mean, the files that you use to generate your compile time benchmarks are yeah. available somewhere. Uh, the files, they are not. Oh, sorry. The question is whether the f files for the benchmarks are available. For which benchmarks? The, w the, the one in the beginning? No, I'm talking about the compile time benchmarks that you showed at the end. OK. Uh, yeah, well, the, the files are generated. So. There's a script which generates the files, and I can show you it uh, later on how, how it's done. I'd just like to add a little bit because some things seem a bit odd. For example, I know that Clang uh, does not uh, actually, uh, like when you erase the type using a lambda, normally in Clang, the, the type will stay long because yeah. the, type, the type of the lambda is going to be like uh, uh, anonymous, blah, 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 with you know, if the type, yeah. and then there's something very long. So I'm actually quite surprised that you are getting a compound improvement by doing it on client. But yeah. on SVC, on the, other, on the other end, uh, things are different. So I, I, I was just curious to see uh, how you actually generate your compound benchmarks because these things can be tricky. And, yeah, I yeah, definitely. I, I was actually surprised as well because I checked the type myself and I've seen that the type is still long. However, it compiles much faster. So it could be something else also. That's what I'm mainly... OK, yeah, we can check that later. I don't, yeah, definitely. Are there any questions? Are there questions? If not, then thank you.